There we go. Hey, hey, Andrew, nice to see you. Hey, morning. How's everyone doing? Great. Haven't been outside yet, so we're great. <laughs> Yeah, I took the dog out already this morning, and uh, I think she wanted to come in faster than I did, which is always a, that's not a good sign. <laughs> yeah, Edo, for you in Seattle, um, it is like negative temps all week in Minnesota. Times You left time. Yeah, I'm not missing that. <laughs> <laughs> Edo, how is it in Seattle? You liking uh -huh. it? Yeah, so far so good. Uh, it's I think it's gonna take some time to get used to the rain, though. So, <laughs> well, you moved in rainy season. I've been out there in the summer. It's it's beautiful. So you'll enjoy yourself. It's almost kind of it's kind of like Minnesota in a way. Oh yeah, I I I'm excited for the mountains and all the hiking and all the good stuff. So, I'm sure there's lots of good running trails out there for you, right? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think we should give it a, another minute, Zach, would you say so? Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people logging on still, so. Right, great. Well, for those who are already, um, this is being recorded. I'm Paget. I'm the new co-chair of Emerging Leaders, and we're so happy to see you all for the first roundtable of 2022. And I will say that again in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Is Desiree able to make it this morning? No, she's at home with the kiddos, sick. Gotcha. Tis, tis the season. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, our office was, has been closed until this week, the whole year already because of both COVID and other sicknesses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Zach, how are things at the chamber? Things are going great. I we're doing a lot more virtual things, but we're still trucking along. <laughs> good, good. All right, Patrick. I haven't seen anyone else log on lately, so I think we're good to get started. All right. Well, um, I'm Patrick Pengelly the co-chair of the Emerging Leaders Board, and thanks for being here today. Um, this is the first of 2020's roundtable discussions on community reinvesting. Um, we have Frank Altman here today to do a great presentation um, and share what you're most interested in discussing today in the chat when you get a chance um, and introduce yourself if you, if you feel like it. Um, Let's see, I am a social investments representative at Excel Energy, so I work in community affairs. Um, and yeah, so excited to be planning some amazing programming for emerging leaders. And then Desiree Antilla, our other co-chair, can't be with us today. Um, you'll be muted, so just unmute yourself if you have questions. And feel free to keep your video on so the speaker can see you. And at the end, there will be time to engage in these questions. So just feel free to submit any questions you have throughout the presentation. Um, and again, you can see the webinar after this call today. It is being recorded. Um, we want to thank the Emerging Leader sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be able to be providing these roundtables. Um, the presenting sponsor is Excel Energy, and our premier sponsor is Wells Fargo. Um, supporting sponsors, McGough, and media sponsor is Minneapolis and St. Paul Business Journal. And then before we get started, while we have everyone on, we wanted to make sure you all know about our next roundtable discussion in February, focusing on the state of the arts. It is on Friday, February 18th, so mark your calendars and share it on social. Um, next, Edo, I want you to go ahead and, and introduce yourself and and uh, talk about Frank and, and yeah, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really excited, our first event of the year. Uh, a little bit about myself, my name is Adam Wender and I'm a business development associate with the Seattle Children's Hospital, working with the intellectual property core team. I just recently moved here, so I'm super new, but uh, 
Uh, very pumped about uh, today's topic. And the reason that I invited uh, Frank, I think uh, we all are aware that, you know, with pandemic and the death of George Floyd, uh, there's been a lot of challenges with the small businesses, especially uh, minority owned businesses. And we've always been looking for ways to give back and, uh, you know, be able to kind of help out the community. And I felt like Frank was the, uh, would be the best person to uh, kind of give us a, a little bit uh, more history about his, his work and some of the work that he has done with uh, uh, helping uh, providing capital to small businesses uh, here, in, uh, I mean, in Minneapolis. So a little bit about Frank. Uh, he's the CEO of the Community Reinvestment uh, Fund. Uh, and as a founder, uh, Frank has done a lot of work uh, in terms of developing a secondary market for the community and also economic development loans. And he's been uh, with a uh, 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 foundation for uh, quite a long time uh, and he has achieved a, a lot. And uh, some of these uh, accomplishments, uh, he's, he's been able to fund more than uh, uh, four billion dollars in uh, loans for creating uh, small businesses, uh, nonprofit, charter school, and also housing projects uh, all over the country. Um, he's a Brown University graduate uh, and also a senior fellow of the ASHO, uh, the Worldwide uh, Market Network for Social Entrepreneur and funding member of uh, uh, Kind. Kind Red. Uh, with that, Frank, uh, the floor is yours, uh, and please take over. Great, thanks, Otto, and uh, glad to meet all of you. I got to figure out how to get the, my share my screen now, so bear with me a second. All right, are you seeing it? Yep, yes. Okay, perfect. All right, um, I'm gonna uh, run through uh, a little bit about who CRF is and really uh, uh, want you to be thinking about and helping me understand the most pressing problems that you're seeing in uh, your businesses uh, as we try to emerge from the pandemic and uh, build uh, and rebuild uh, the Twin Cities, uh, particularly after the civil unrest uh, that we had um, after the George Floyd murder. So. A little bit about CRF. We are a, a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we've been around for uh, about 34 years now, uh, focusing on uh, bringing the capital markets to Main Street. And uh, uh, increasingly, we're focused on uh, building a just economy that works for all. Our core mission uh, and vision and, and values are here. Uh, our mission is to uh, help people improve their lives and strengthen their communities through innovative financial solutions. As I indicated, our vision is a just economy that works for all. Uh, we have a number of uh, core values that uh, you can see here, e equitable ec economic opportunities, uh, leading through collaboration, transforming through innovation, excelling at all we do, and acting with integrity. Uh, our track record, uh, we, we work uh, together with a network of community-based lending organizations around the country. So we're not doing all of this ourselves. Uh, we're really trying to build an integrated network that brings capital and resources to uh, small businesses and other, <clears throat> other uh, actors in the community. Uh, we, we, this is slides a little bit old. I thought we were up to date, but we've originated, originated more than 3.5 billion in, in, uh, in loans and financings uh, directly. Uh, created uh, or helped to retain 156,000 jobs. Um, the majority of our lending activity is in low-income communities uh, and uh, really trying to help build community wealth. Uh, we've, we've helped to fund more than 9,000 small businesses. Uh, most of those small businesses uh, are uh, diverse in the sense of ownership by BIPOC people, women, and veterans. Um, more than half owned by uh, people of color and uh, just about 44% are women owned. Um, in in, in uh, concert with about 200 uh, local development organizations, we've helped to finance an addition to additional $207 million in uh, financings through uh, a platform uh, that matches borrowers to, uh, to lenders. Uh, the average loan size is $62,000. So we're getting to borrowers that are being missed by banks uh, in many cases. Uh, and uh, 
We've worked with 98 partners on this platform uh, to date, uh, with about a, just under 70% of the businesses being uh, owned by diverse uh, populations. And then <clears throat> we've originated on this platform uh, through our Spark technology. And I'm talking about a couple of technology platforms. We get into that a little bit later. Uh, more than $10 billion uh, on, that, on that platform. We believe small businesses are the backbone of the economy. And there's a challenge that we're, that we're facing in this country. And the, the, the challenge is really uh, widening uh, wealth gaps and particularly a widening racial wealth gap. And so as you can see uh, from these uh, charts, uh, the, 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 gap, uh, the gap is getting wider uh, and um, it's getting, things are getting better for um, white uh, populations and uh, uh, either leveling off or falling for uh, populations of color. Um, uh, and that's something that we really are trying to uh, push back on. I think it's important to understand the role that uh, organizations like ours play. We are a social enterprise and social enterprises uh, generally are trying to fix uh, some of the problems that <laughs> capitalism doesn't address very well. And, uh, and capitalism is wonderfully uh, ex excellent at, <clears throat> at uh, creating markets and uh, prices, uh, but prices don't always uh, reflect what, what the true costs are uh, of an activity. And uh, they don't, and, and capitalism tends to be agnostic about wealth gaps. Uh, so we have to work on this from a different perspective and that's what we're trying to do. <clears throat> um, so we have a, uh, uh, a theory of change uh, that is focused on uh, small business ownership and quality jobs uh, as the key to improving uh, economic mobility. And so we look both for opportunities to build wealth by ownership of businesses, particularly ownership of businesses by uh, people of color and women, but also uh, making sure that the businesses we finance are providing quality jobs, uh, jobs that, uh, that promote a living wage or jobs that uh, are in businesses that have a ladder to a uh, uh, living wage. And it's particularly important when we look at uh, uh, the kinds of businesses that we support uh, that those businesses uh, have an entry point for people uh, with lower skills. Uh, so there's an opportunity for upward mobility. Uh, as I indicated earlier, we believe in partnerships and technology to enable an exponential impact. Uh, and so we have a series of financial products uh, that we have been co-creating with, with others. And we'll talk about what we're doing in the Twin Cities in, in a few minutes. Uh, we design and manage financial programs uh, with impact capital. Uh, and we have a, a number of corporate and uh, um, bank and other investors that are really investing uh, for the social impact that we're able to create uh, through these efforts. And then uh, we orchestrate this network through a capital access and distribution system uh, that helps orchestrate the network, grows the capacity of the organizations on the network and helps small business navigate uh, the complexities of uh, small business support ecosystems. And really that, if you think about it, Every city, every state in this country has some sort of economic development program. Uh, very difficult for people to find out where they fit, where, what programs are eligible for them. So we've been really working hard to create this platform uh, that helps people navigate to the right uh, place where they're gonna actually have a successful uh, uh, winning <coughs> uh, arrangement. This is a, a picture of that model and uh, I really want to, want to emphasize this concept of integrated capital, which is not just capital, but value added services. And that's capital, coaching and technical assistance. Uh, we're working right now on building business insights, data insights for, for small businesses uh, and all glued together on technology platforms. Uh, we distribute the, the resources through community development organizations and uh, ultimately uh, that capital goes to, it, it, to small businesses that are historically underrepresented in, in finance. This tells you a little bit about how we've been filling the financial gap. Uh, we've about 88% of the activity that we've done in the, in, in the last fiscal year, so fiscal year 21, which ended on uh, June 30th, uh, about 88% of our loans were in low-income communities or serving low-income targeted populations. Uh, about 83% were to uh, diverse-owned businesses, 65% were BIPOC-owned businesses, and 48% were to women-owned businesses. I won't go through all those details. Uh, and then innovative products. Uh, we have two platforms. 
uh, that have been generating uh, a tremendous benefit uh, around the country. Uh, connected capital, which uh, levels the playing field for small business owners seeking capital from responsible lenders. 48% uh, of the loans made on that platform uh, to date are uh, to uh, small businesses uh, owned by uh, people of color. Uh, and uh, uh, in the Spark platform, which is a loan origination platform that's being used by community development, financial institutions, and, uh, and a number of banks, uh, we've generated uh, $10 billion in total financing, of which $4 billion has been uh, used to help originate um, uh, loans in the last year. Now we're building a number of uh, uh, recovery loan funds that, that we're focusing on uh, helping businesses after the in the recovery phase after the pandemic, and also in in cities where there were uh, civil dis where there was civil disrest. Uh, and uh, you can see here we have a number of funds that are in, underway, including in the Minnesota area, what we're calling the Minnesota Inclusive Growth Fund. Uh, that is a fund that was sponsored by a coalition of minority-led uh, community development financial institutions in, uh, in the state uh, and is uh, focused primarily on, um, on bringing more capital to businesses that are historically underrepresented here. Uh, we're just about ready to launch uh, one in um, Detroit, the Motor City Contractor Fund. Uh, we've done uh, about uh, millions of dollars worth of financing in Chicago, uh, New York, uh, Rhode Island, California, Washington State, uh, we're doing something right now in LA County and in, in the South, we're really excited about a, a real coalition of states uh, coming together under the Southern Opportunity and Resiliency Fund. So these are all funds that are privately financed primarily. There's some state money in a few of them. Uh, they, they build on both philanthropy and uh, socially motivated investments uh, to uh, put capital at scale in back into the businesses that uh, are trying to grow out of the pandemic and the aftermath of the pandemic. In the Twin Cities, we've been very involved in uh, responding both to the pandemic and uh, our civil unrest. Um, uh, we've in close partnership with community stakeholders, we've originated more than 200 uh, paycheck protection loans in, uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, that is uh, a small part of uh, a national work that we did, which was uh, um, close to 10,000 loans in uh, uh, and uh, three quarters of a billion dollars in paycheck protect protection loans. 69% uh, of those uh, borrowers are either led or owned by BIPOC populations that were located in low income uh, communities. And then uh, we've also been very active in the corridor rebuild, rebuild and reimagine uh, work that was uh, undertaken after the murder of George Floyd. We partnered with the Lake Street Council and we are supporting the administration of their $10 million grant fund to have small businesses located in the corridor. We're also working on the other quarters that were uh, affected by the dis uh, by the uh, civil unrest, uh, West Broadway and the, uh, and the Midway District on um, University Avenue. Uh, we are looking long term uh, at helping to rebuild our communities. Uh, immediately, obviously, we're working on the things that, uh, that have to be done right away, but we are focused on the long term by building flexible, affordable capital products. Um, business support resources. Uh, uh, it's not just capital, sometimes it's know-how that's necessary. And we're really trying to get and listen to the voice of the community. So I'm hopeful that we'll get some feedback from you on what we could be doing here uh, as well. Um, the Catalyst Coalition is unique, I think, to uh, uh, the Twin Cities in how it's organized. Uh, formed in 2016 uh, under the leadership of then Gary Cunningham at, Cunningham at MEDA. Uh, uh, it brought together uh, all, all of the, almost all of the uh, minority-led um, community development lending organizations in the, in the greater Twin Cities area. Uh, and currently is, uh, the membership is CRF, the Northside Economic Opportunity Network, or NEON, uh, Metropolitan Economic Development Agents, uh, Agency, which is MEDA, African Economic Development Solutions, Latino Economic Development Center, uh, and uh, we've also uh, are seeking uh, additional members uh, of the coalition that are focused primarily on bringing capital to uh, underrepresented um, businesses owned by people of color. Uh, a couple of things that are coming down the pike that I think are really important for you to understand. Uh, 
in uh, in late late last uh, year, just a little over a year ago, the Congress passed a very sweeping package uh, as part of the, the the CARES Act, and that included uh, a restart of the State Small Business Credit Initiative, or SSBCI. Um, that program is uh, will be launching in mid-February. Uh, it is run by the tr U.S. Treasury Department. Uh, Congress has, has appropriated $10 billion for this program. And the program is run by each state and each state gets an allocation based on population unemployment data. Minnesota will be getting 75 million uh, in this, from this program over uh, uh, three different tranches or uh, funding periods. And most importantly, this money is to be leveraged 10 to one, $10 of private capital for every federal dollar that comes through the state small business credit initiative. So uh, we're, we're talking about close to a billion dollars in potential funding in the state of Minnesota for small businesses and recovery after the uh, uh, pandemic. Why is this important to CRF? Well, we're, we want to really network the community development financial institutions that serve low-income populations uh, into this program because many of the uh, channels that the program used in the past did not really reach uh, low-income low people. And Congress actually uh, provided that uh, three billion must go to uh, uh, socially and economically disadvantaged individuals or SETI as the, as the acronym is called. And that's a big challenge uh, for many of the banks and others that are gonna be using this program. So, but we hope to use the platforms I talked about earlier to link our statewide community development uh, lending ecosystem uh, to, the, to the sources of capital that are coming from this, this fund and uh, really drive capital into those areas uh, that don't normally get it. And then finally, I mentioned the Minnesota Inclusive Growth Fund. Uh, it provides flexible, affordable capital and business support services uh, to businesses across the state. Uh, it's sponsored by the Catalyst Coalition, but it is a statewide effort. Uh, and uh, it was launched uh, uh, several weeks uh, before the end of the year, uh, and it will be uh, ultimately up to $50 million in financing. So I want to end by just re uh, relating uh, the real benefit that we're trying to create with these activities. And I've got two uh, stories to tell you. One is Aruba Restoration and uh, to Sound Health which is a um, women and minority owned uh, business uh, that is a community-based health facility. It is located in North Minneapolis and serves primarily people of color supporting healthier communities. Uh, Anissa Keys is the owner and she says, having a resource like CRF and its partners on our side has made an enormous difference in our success. And then uh, Caribou Grocery in Delhi, which uh, technically is not in Minneapolis, it's actually in St. Paul uh, on Railroad Island. Uh, that is a, uh, an, organiza an organization, family-run uh, company uh, that um, restored <coughs> uh, an old abandoned gas station site, uh, remediated, and uh, built a, a, a community resource, a grocery in Delhi that focuses primarily on uh, uh, the cultural uh, foods of uh, Ethiopia and uh, in Eastern uh, Africa. Uh, it is uh, both a deli that serves food. Yeah, it also has all sorts of uh, groceries uh, that support uh, the community. Uh, I love this because I introduced this, uh, this person at uh, the ribbon cutting. And I thought I would never, ever introduce Muhammad Ali in my life, but his name is Muhammad Ali. The day our loan was approved was the happiest day of our lives. There are resources like CRF that can help. Uh, and this is a thriving business that's made it through, both of these businesses have made it through the, uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully are on their way to growth. So with that, I am going to stop and turn it back over to you, Zach and uh, Edo, and uh, I'll take whatever questions uh, people want to discuss. I really want to hear what you think the needs are in the communities that your, uh, your businesses are operating in. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, if anyone has any questions for Frank, um, I, kn I know a lot of people that registered for this event um, have a lot of great uh, experience and I'm sure uh, questions that they'd like to ask um, about, 
about how we can better invest in our community. So um, if anyone has a question or some feedback, um, I feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask it. Um, you can also put it in the chat um, and we can uh, read them off uh, for you there as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Frank, for the great presentation. We have two comments in the chat. Um, so one is kind of about Brooklyn Parks organization um, that I, I for, forgive me about the names, but Quia um, wants to know uh, about the West African refugee community and, and immigrants. Um, so I don't know if you want to start there. Well, sure. First of all, we have financed um, numerous uh, immigrant-owned uh, businesses, uh, particularly in the Lake Street corridor, uh, but we also have financed businesses in uh, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, uh, that sort of north <coughs> northwest uh, suburbs. Uh, we are, uh, again, very focused on trying to understand the voice of the community, and I'll give you a couple of examples uh, where we've been active <coughs> in the uh, uh, Potter, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Phillips neighborhood, we financed a uh, uh, company a number of years ago called La Perla. Uh, and La Perla is a family owned business started by <coughs> an immigrant from Mexico who uh, started working as a dishwasher at uh, one of the great restaurants in the Twin Cities. But he always had an ear for entrepreneurship. And he, his vision was that he was going to build a company that would provide uh, jobs for his entire family. Uh, he and his wife started making uh, uh, tortillas and selling them in the Mercado on, on Lake Street uh, with help from a neighborhood development center. Uh, and then uh, as they grew, they decided they were going to try to go in, uh, into distribution in, through grocery stores around the Twin Cities and, and, the, and actually in what, <clears throat> Western Wisconsin. Uh, and they, uh, we helped them uh, finance a building and uh, a, a line uh, to make uh, tacos at scale, uh, or to tortillas at scale. Uh, and we did that in conjunction with the Latino Development Center. So, so you can see how this networking approach uh, works. We have the Capital Latino Development Center had the technical assistance resources to help the business go from um, sort of a boutique to something that was uh, scalable. And I think they're now making 3 million uh, tortillas a week. Uh, and you'll find them uh, under the, the Perla label. Uh, uh, so we, we are looking for the uh, types of businesses owned by very scrappy entrepreneurs, many of which are people who have uh, immigrated or have become refugees and uh, they're building a new life in, in Minnesota. Uh, and so, yes, we're very, very interested and would love to work with you on whatever opportunities there are in Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center and so forth. Thank you, Frank. This is Victoria. <laughs> Actually, it's just my uh, my Zoom name. So this is Victoria. I'm the one who asked the question about Brooklyn okay. Park. Great to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. So my other question will be, um, when you're working with these small organizations, how do you get them to go through the, like overcome the obstacle of, of um, credit score, collateral, and all of those obstacles that a lot of small businesses face in terms of um, not having those, having access to resources. Right, <clears throat> great question. And I wanna say that uh, one of the things that uh, we did uh, as an organization and the aftermath of uh, the civil unrest <clears throat> was to really, what I, what I say is interrogate our processes, products and procedures to make sure that we are uh, not inadvertently um, excluding otherwise credit worthy organizations because uh, of white bias. Uh, I don't think that we've gotten rid of that at all. The whole financial system in this country, if you look at the data, uh, people of color get turned down. They don't get uh, more, more than white people. They don't get the same amount of loans volume that they're looking for. Uh, it's clear Federal Reserve Bank uh, has done a number of, of uh, studies on this. So we know that we know the problem is embedded in the financial system. I don't think it's necessarily uh, 
a system that intends these outcomes, but the outcomes are there. And I think it's because people have hidden bias in how they, how they approach things. So we, are, we have undertaken this uh, internal look. We've actually created a department of uh, <coughs> inclusion and, uh, um, uh, and, and economic development that is really focusing on bringing in uh, the voice of the community around in the communities that we're serving, as well as uh, understanding the credit needs of the community. So that being said, uh, most of the lending that we've been doing uh, in the last few years has been through the Small Business Administration 7A program. And the 7A program has a tremendous number of hoops to jump through. Uh, we, in the last several years, we've been able to really build uh, our balance sheet in part with a uh, receipt of a $15 million uh, grant from Mackenzie Scott. I don't know if you've been following what she's doing, but she's been giving away billions of dollars and CRF was uh, fortunate to receive a, a portion of that. And that's allowed us to take uh, a much more flexible uh, role in the way that we underwrite loans. So we just we have just <clears throat> modified our our credit policy uh, with respect to the SBA program, uh, and we are no longer requiring uh, collateral, uh, 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 particularly um, second uh, second liens on people's homes, because we realize a lot of people don't that are in business uh, in low income communities don't own a home. We we have uh, eliminated uh, the uh, uh, the need for key person life insurance. Uh, that was a that was a that's pretty much a prudent pro process that most banks and others use. We've been using it. Uh, we've only had to call on a life insurance policy twice in the 30 years that we are here. It's very hard for people to get uh, life insurance uh, in, in BIPOC communities because insurance companies raise the rates. So we eliminated that. So uh, so my that's a long winded answer to saying we're still working on. On that, but we're we're really taking a hard look uh, at how can we get to yes, uh, in, particularly in uh, low wealth communities where there isn't a lot of collateral that could be pledged. I'm very aware that uh, uh, that the way that small businesses generally uh, fund themselves are through the resources of the founders, family, friends, and fools. Uh, and if you're in a low income community and your family doesn't have any money, uh, you're not you're not at the same point in being able to raise the capital necessary, the risk capital necessary to get a business going. So we hope to be uh, a sort of play that role of the, of, of the friendly uh, um, investor uh, wherever we can. Thanks, Frank, that was amazing. Yeah, in the chat, um, someone said, wow, that's amazing. We need to break those financial barriers. So um, next, uh, also Victoria, I apologize for um, missing your name on that chat. Great question. No, that, no that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, next, we have Eben, um, grad student studying strategic foresight at the University of Houston, but based in Minneapolis. Um, he's a, they are a freelance creative project manager currently working with the Midway Contemporary Art and Bungalow Group and is here to learn about organizations using business as a lever for social change. Glad to meet you, Eben. Uh, I'm not quite sure <laughs> um, what your question is here, so I'll, uh, if you want to. Uh, yeah, I did not. I did not really have a question. I was more responding to the kind of like introduce yourself prompt, and oh, I, I see. Like, I see you as being the person representing. Like you're running kind of like a business that's using. You're using these business, the business that make these loans as a lever to kind of move some of these social and economic issues that you've been talking about. So. If I, you're I, answering my questions. <laughs> I, I would just add that we've been uh, increasingly trying to find what I would say are social ventures. They don't have to be nonprofits. We, we are. Um, the idea of a, of a for-profit social venture was pretty foreign back in the late uh, 80s when we got uh, CRF going. Uh, but uh, there are, there are a numerous um, social enterprises now that are being created as uh, for-profit or limited profit um, businesses, uh, B corporations, uh, are, or public benefit corporations that uh, are, are organized to serve the needs of the community as well as shareholders uh, under uh, under state uh, corporate statutes. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening uh, that is bringing business acumen together with social uh, 
social missions. And uh, and I encourage you just to keep looking at those as you're as you're working through your grad school program. Thank you. Um, we have somebody with their hand raised, so I'll go to them, and then we have one more question in the chat, and then we will go to breakouts. Um, Kim, do you want to go ahead? Sure, good morning, and thank you for the presentation. I am here from the Minnesota Home Ownership Center, so I lead the strategy around home ownership. So it's always good to hear about small businesses. So thank you. I just have a question because you, in, in my downtime, I mentor. Um, I work with an organization and I mentor youth girls, right? And I'm just wondering, it would be great. Do you do any work with any high schools or, you know, I think it's, you know, it, it would be great where um, a lot of, you know, our young younger folks would hear these messaging and that have, that have the spirit of entrepreneurship and want to do something, but don't know what to do with it. We have not worked with high school students um, with the exception of a, an effort a number of years ago where we tried to set up apprenticeships with uh, uh, one student from in, the Minneapolis district and one from the St. Paul district. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we thought it was going to be a something that the superintendents and leaders would really uh, uh, be excited about. Uh, so we asked for, for them, for the leadership of the school districts to identify the students. And we got two fabulous students. Uh, and then the, both school districts just ignored us after that. And we just couldn't, we couldn't get it going. And this is, this is 25 years ago, probably. Hmm. Uh, both of those students uh, are still very attached to CRF. Uh, one of whom is now uh, a senior leader at the McKnight Foundation. Uh, the other has been in finance. Uh, they are both people of color. Uh, and so we know that uh, if you get to the right students at the right time in their lives, it, it can be a career path uh, that helps them identify a career path. But we just didn't have the, uh, maybe we didn't have the right model for how that was supposed to work. Uh, but we, what we do do is we, at least by, by the way, these uh, apprenticeships were paid. We've never had uh, a, an unpaid intern in CRF and we've had more than a hundred interns over our, our lifetime. Uh, we believe that you pay people uh, for what they do and, and we give interns um, from both undergraduate and graduate schools uh, uh, true work to do. It's not something about making copies at the copy machine or um, brewing coffee. It is about um, learning the, what we do at CRF and, and how to underwrite or how to service a loan, how to manage uh, compliance, all the stuff that, uh, that we do as a financial institution. So uh, we, are, we are in the internship business. Uh, and if, they, if you have ideas about how we could get into the high schools uh, in, uh, in a way that would be meaningful, um, we're very open to it. Yeah, I'd love to connect with you. So I'll, um, let's connect. Um... I don't know how we can connect. I can leave you my contact. I, will, I, I, I can give you my, my information for everybody. Maybe I'll put that in the chat. I we usually have it on our slides and we don't. Okay, okay. Because I, 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 yeah, I'm with an organization that's been funded by the state and that is that has connections in high schools, working with youth girls, youth, youth young men, and they're in communities of color. They're right inner city. Mm -hmm. And I think with the unrest and everything that's going on, um, it would be really good to help have them focus on something, right? So anyway, let's connect on that. I should say one other thing. We, we have both in the Twin Cities and around the country, we have been focused on helping uh, organizations that are serving youth uh, to uh, build their facilities, uh, build out their programs. And it, this, this ranges from uh, boys and girls clubs in some communities to... Oh. to um, uh, in our in our own community, Abandoned Communities, which is okay. uh, right down, uh, also in the Phillips neighborhood, uh, it serves 125 uh, at-risk youth uh, from uh, kindergarten through uh, high school. They have a, they have a tremendous um, a graduation rate, and many of the the students have gone through their programs uh, are now mentoring other students that are coming up. It's a great program. Uh, it's a few blocks away from uh, where everything burned. Uh, and uh, um, but they're they're there and they're in the community and embedded. So if we if we can find more organizations like that where we can be helpful in financing their facilities, we do that as well. 
Great. I will definitely reach out to you. Thank you. All right. And I do want us to get to um, the Q&A. So um, the last question from Brent in the chat was about um, work with supporting cooperative or employee-owned ESOP company models. Um, Frank, maybe you can um, do a follow-up afterwards with, with that person. Um, I'll just answer quickly, yes. We do, we do ESOPs and uh, cooperatives, and we're working right now on the, on the policy front to get the SBA to agree that cooperatives are small businesses that can be financed using SBA products. So stay tuned. Thank you. All right, Q&A. Um, Zach will put us into breakout groups, and we will have a quick chat. Yeah, and uh, Paget, just right before we do that, just uh, thanks again, Frank, for for everything. I I guess we we got a lot of information here, which is great. And I just uh, before we jump into breakout rooms, if you could just summarize, um, we have a lot of amazing community leaders on the call here today. Uh, not just community members, but uh, leaders of, of businesses that can help support the work that you do. So um, if you could summarize everything into what is one thing that the people on the call here today can do to support the work that uh, your organization does or just the mission that you're striving for, what is one thing that uh, we can all do mo moving forward? I'll give you two things. Identify the businesses that are getting left behind and, and send them our, our way and we'll see if we can be helpful. We can't say yes to everybody, at that, but that's certainly important. We uh, uh, getting Getting the uh, awareness in the communities that we're trying to serve is very important. So anytime you see somebody that you think might be a benefit, might benefit from working with CRF, we, we'd love that. And secondly, <clears throat> um, we're continuously needing uh, uh, social capital, uh, investor capital. So uh, uh, interesting to see uh, Excel Energy has a social uh, investment uh, uh, arm that I wasn't aware of. So so uh, we, we, we raise a lot of uh, debt, uh, socially motivated debt from corporations and, uh, uh, and foundations and banks. And the more that we can raise, the more that we can do. Thanks, Frank. All right, so I'm gonna um, break us all off into breakout rooms to give everyone the opportunity to uh, have network with each other, build more connections. Um, and we'll uh, be in breakout rooms to the end of the hour. Thanks a lot for having me. Yep, okay. thanks, Frank. Thank you very much, Frank.